From Penn State University, this is Pennsylvania Inside Out, connecting communities to a world of creativity and knowledge. Here's tonight's host, Patty Satalia. Welcome to Pennsylvania Inside Out. From 1951 until 1974, hundreds of Philadelphia prisoners were used as human guinea pigs in an array of unethical and oftentimes dangerous medical experiments. The experiments left many test subjects, most of whom were African Americans, in excruciating pain and with long-term health problems. Our guests are Alan Hornblum, author of Sentence to Science, One Black Man's Story of Imprisonment in America. He's the first person to shine a light on this dark chapter in American medical history. Also with us is Eddie Anthony, now known as Yusuf Anthony. His story is the focus of Hornbloom's book, which is published by Penn State Press. Thank you both so much for joining us. Good to be with you, Patty. Well, how did you first learn that Holmesburg prison uh, inmates were being used as test subjects? Well, I witnessed it. I was actually just out of graduate school, and I decided in the early 70s that I wanted to do some positive work for society rather than completing my graduate education. So I started working in the Philadelphia prisons, and it was on my initial tours through the complex of prisons in Philly that I saw scores of men wearing adhesive tape and bandages and all sorts of wraps around their heads and backs and arms, and I couldn't imagine the prison was that safe. You know, were these, you know, knife fights on a cell block or a gang war in the prison yard? And the next day, I asked the guard on the saw block, what's with all these guys who were strapped and wrapped in adhesive tape and bandages? He says, oh, that's nothing. That's just the perfume test for the University of Pennsylvania. And I said, what? And he said, yeah, they're, they're doing uh, perfume experiments. And it, it was so uh, ridiculous to see these men who were, you know, many cases, uh, killers and, and rapists and, and burglars and robbers, you know, testing perfume. I couldn't imagine it. But... In fact, what I had learned was that experiments had been going on, medical experiments, serious invasive procedures, for 20 years before I ever got there. And not just cosmetics and perfumes. Absolutely. I thought that was in the minority if there was any perfume. They, they were doing uh, just anything you can imagine, from the innocuous to the truly dangerous. Now, was this an anomaly in, in Holmesburg prison, or is this something that's gone on in other prisons across the country? It was widespread in the Cold War years in America. Uh, from the end of the Second World War to the mid-70s, at least half the states had one prison that were hosting prison medical experiments. Pennsylvania, unfortunately, led the way with at least 10 prisons that were doing this. And it was quite common during those post-war years where institutionalized populations were being used as human guinea pigs by the medical community. Your book really is a, an indictment of the Philadelphia uh, prison system and the medical community. How did the two come to work together? Well, it was obviously a, a marriage of convenience. There were folks in the pharmaceutical community and the medical community who wanted to do clinical trials. The University of Pennsylvania is a big research operation, so it was convenient to them and everybody if they could find cheap and available test subjects, and that's what the prison system afforded them. The inmates themselves were desperate to make money, not particularly well educated, so they naturally gravitated to a test where they could make far more money being a guinea pig than they could pushing a broom on a cell block. Was it money that lured you to do your first test? Yes, it was money and um, the fact that I didn't have people coming up to visit me at the time to put money on the books for me so I could go to the commissary at the store and uh, also they was using it to uh, get bail money if you had low bail. You could possibly get out on bail by participating in the tests, you know. That's, that's uh, basically what lured me. You know what I mean? Tell us about your first test. Um, they signed me to a uh, Johnson & Johnson bubble bath test. And uh, I went over there, and uh, if you ever seen the cover of uh, Acres of Skin, they have a guy sitting on the table with patches on his back. Well, they put six patches on my back of bubble bath. But it was a solution they sprayed on my back to seal the pores on my back so that the tape would stick on, so that my back wouldn't sweat, and it was very toxic. That got into my bloodstream, and it poisoned me. And I'm still suffering from that particular uh, test right now in the day. My hands and stuff broke out, my feet. Uh, my if we had a shot of your fingernails, we yeah, could see yeah. that, that your fingernails right. uh, are, are rougher than, than normal and fingernails. And they were a half inch and, thick. And this, these look good now. These look good now compared to the way they were when I was incarcerated and through the years. You know, they was like uh, my f one finger was the size of two fingers, and, the, and, the, and the, uh, my fingernails was growing like claws, 
And be, in fact, before my hands and feet broke out, my whole body was inflamed after the uh, poison got into my system. It was benzoids and isotopes in the, the chemicals in the can. And we was, I was sensitive to it. Is it likely that he really wasn't testing bubble bath? <laughs> Probably was not, but we don't know for sure. These mm -hmm. men were actually treated like guinea pigs. They weren't told exactly what it was. In many cases, they were deceived. Mm -hmm. I haven't found anybody who knew that they were being injected with radioactive isotopes who were told they were being uh, at involved in a test with Dow Chemical where dioxin was being placed on their faces and backs. So in many cases, just like you would not tell a guinea pig, this is what I'm going to do to you today, they did this with human beings right. in the prison system. And it wasn't just the University of Pennsylvania Medical School involved in this. Uh, it was also the Army and the CIA. There was military testing going on as well. If you were in the business mm. of testing products or wanting to put a product on the market, you knew about Dr. Kligman, mm. University of Pennsylvania, and Holmesburg Prison. They were infamous, notorious in the field of human experimentation. So you had Dow Chemical in Michigan coming to Philadelphia. You had uh, uh, R.J. Reynolds in North Carolina uh, for tobacco cancer tests coming to Philadelphia. You had the Army in Edgewood Arsenal, Maryland coming to Philadelphia mm -hmm. because they knew that was a site where you could get anything tested on people. So those mm -hmm. are the contractors. Who That's were right. Who are uh, Correct. paying? You're making a little bit of right. money. The prisons making a fair They're amount. They're making of money. more, and the doctors and the major proprietors, you know, the chemical companies, pharmaceutical companies, are making the big bucks. Now, you mentioned a moment ago, uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Hornbloom's first book, Acres of Skin: Human right. Experiments right. at Holmesburg Prison: A True Story of Abuse and Exploitation in the Name of Medical Science. When mm -hmm. that book came out, right. you and others in the Philadelphia community, I think, were astounded to read right. that this was your story out there. That's right. And, and we thought that we didn't have a, a case or a way to go, uh, you know, get recompense for what we went through. But after the book came out, we decided to come up with a class action lawsuit because uh, we, we found it, it's a, it's a law called the rule of discovery. We thought we had signed away our rights when we were incarcerated, and we found out that the papers that they used was illegal. But when the book came out, it pointed, you know, to the direction that they had uh, misused us. So we came up with the uh, class action lawsuit, but we never, never got through the courts. You know what I mean? Well, one of the, you bring up an, an interesting point, one of the hallmarks of the Nuremberg medical trials uh, from 1933 to 1945, Nazi mm -hmm. doctors used concentration right. camps in much the way as the Holmberg, Holmesburg prisons were used, mm -hmm. uh, was uh, a, a code of ethics. And, and one of the codes is informed consent. First principle. Right. Right. Explain what that is, and then I'm going to talk to you about what you thought you were getting. Well, one of the very sad chapters of American medical uh, history in the 20th century is that we tried the Nazi doctors. Hmm. We harangued them. We told them what proper research medicine is like. We executed seven of them. Then we write this excellent code of ten principles, but we never bought into it ourselves. It was a remarkable. We told other countries how to do it. Many of them bought into it, but we ourselves moved into the gilded age of research in the 1950s where we were using uh, retarded subjects, we were using the emotionally disturbed, we were using pregnant women, all sorts of people who were institutionalized were grist for the research mill and that was very sad. With regard to that first principle, it also goes into the fact that the test subjects should not be in a confined or coercive environment, which is particularly poignant to the story of Acres of Skin and Sentence to Science. Our history of using prison inmates is a pretty bleak one, and unfortunately the government is actually thinking of returning to it again. Mm -hmm. So it's something that uh, Youssef and I are very much opposed to. Mm -hmm. What did you think you were getting into? Um, well, they coerced you to believe that the tests were safe, you know, and you know you weren't taking a chance or anything. But when you go over there, they gave you a, a simple piece of paper that read like, uh, if something was to happen to you after the test, you can't hold a University of Pennsylvania responsible. So right there, you would automatically question it. I thought they were safe. They say, they tell you, this is just a formality. Just, you know, you just have to have your signature to make it believe that it was, you know, everything was all right. But after they got you over there, and if you got sick, they didn't have no aftercare in place or nothing, you know? Like, I, this happened to me in 1964, and here it is, uh, 2007, I'm still suffering from that, you know? Yeah. I want to get back to that in just right. a moment. This is Pennsylvania Inside Out on WPSU. I'm Patty Satalia. In his new book, Sentence to Science, author 
Alan Hornblum tells the disturbing story of Eddie Anthony's days as a Holmesburg prison test subject. The book is a searing indictment of the criminal justice and medical communities that disdainfully used Philadelphia inmates as human guinea pigs in an array of unethical and questionable experiments. Our guests are author Alan Hornblum and former test subject Eddie, now Yusuf Anthony. Despite the experience of your first test, and I have right. to say that your inmates, your cellmates, mm -hmm. uh, were fortunate enough to, to undergo more innocuous uh, right. uh, tests, mm -hmm. you signed up to do more because yes, I the, did. the need for money the in need prison for money is a in strong prison one. And, and prison being such a dangerous place. You know, you had the test offered you a, a, a thing of being independent where you didn't have to depend on friends or other inmates, and it was a corrupt environment. So if you had money, on the books, you know, this put a little safety on your on your stay in incarceration. So, uh, you know, like after the money runs out, which was a little bit of money for each test. Give us an idea of you what you might get paid. Well, the first test I was on, in which I'm still suffering from today, I just was 1964, I got something like 30 something dollars. You know, I didn't have to participate in the whole test because of the fact I broke out so bad about the first week. And they told me, well, you don't have to do the rest of the test. And uh, we're going to pay you the whole amount. And the whole amount was thirty something dollars for a twenty-one day, uh, having patches put on my back every day with big blisters uh, bust breaking out on me. And then eventually, my whole body broke out as if I had German measles. And, and people didn't recognize you. In fact, they oh, they uh, steered away from steered you away when you went to the mess hall. When, when I went to the mess hall, they refused to sit down beside me, afraid it was going to it was contagious. It, it would get something. So they had to feed me on the blocks. You know what I mean? This is how bad it was. Then after you get out of jail, uh, they got me controlled. Then when I got out, it broke out again in the street. I had nowhere to go to. They had no aftercare in place for you know that you could go for refuge or for treatment. So I wound up going to the PGH. And when I did finally What's get the there, PTH? Uh, it was the Philadelphia General, General Hospital. Hospital. Okay. And uh, it's no longer in existence. But my hands and feet, the stuff that was in my whole body came down to my hands and feet. My hands were big as uh, eight ounce boxing gloves. I wear a 10 and a half shoe. I couldn't get my foot in a 14 triple eight when they took me in there. And they had me hospitalized for a whole month. And I had to be treated twice for this. Uh, uh, here lately, I haven't got no positive diagnosis of what I got wrong with me. It's something in my blood. Uh, I break out every time the weather gets warm, I break out again. You know, they give me a little sad to bring it under control, but it's, I never get rid of it. You know, in addition, uh, in addition to the, the physical and emotional trauma of having gone through this, um, the African American community seems to be distrustful of the American medical system in general, not because just this, mm -hmm. but also because of Tuskegee, uh, the syphilis experiments, exactly. uh, and, and other things. Talk a little bit about that. The African American community is very reluctant to deal with doctors in the medical community. They have very low rates of participation in. Uh, contributions on on body parts and and transplants and visiting doctors and what have you and it's not just the Tuskegee syphilis study which is probably the most infamous case of unethical medicine but all of these other cases that are out there that maybe haven't you know digested uh, in, in the American uh, Caucasian mind but in for, for example in Philadelphia unfortunately there are so many African Americans who have had relatives who went through Holmesburg mm -hmm. for that quarter century they have heard from fathers or grandfathers or brothers what happened and and you know the circle of friends that Eddie and all the other thousands were used in they really become legitimately distrustful of the American medical community mm -hmm. explain if you would the experiments were conducted quote under the direction of uh, University of Pennsylvania dermatologist Albert Kligman is, is someone you mentioned in your book. What exactly did under the direction of mean? Well, it meant that it was basically his operation. Uh, he walks into Holmesburg Prison back in 1951, ostensibly to help out with another outbreak of ringworm and athlete's foot. Mm -hmm. But he's a very uh, bright, creative guy. And right away, you know, he recognized the potential for research medicine. He sees an institution with 1,200 people, and as he thought to himself and said many times over and over, there were acres of skin in there that you could use for medical experimentation. So he meets with the superintendent of the prison subsequent to that, and he says, I think I can help you out. Maybe you can help me. And over a handshake, they develop a system that runs for a quarter century 